Amen. Friends, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Good morning and welcome. My name is Tony Sundermeyer. I'm one of the pastors here at First Presbyterian Church of Atlanta. It's so good to be together uh, on this Easter Sunday, this Resurrection Day. Uh, welcome to all of you who are here uh, in the sanctuary, and welcome to all of you who are worshiping with us remotely. Before we go any further, we'd love to invite you to stand, to move about the sanctuary. Let's say good morning and welcome to First Presbyterian Church. As you return to your seats, let me just offer uh, our deep, deep gratitude to our Flower Guild who prepared uh, the sanctuary and uh, our campus with beautiful flowers and our various worship spaces and places where we'll fellowship the beautiful flower cross that you saw as you uh, came into worship this morning. Very grateful uh, for all the time, effort, and energy they have uh, put in to make our space so beautiful. Uh, immediately following worship, we are going to have fellowship on Peachtree Street. Well, not in the street, but on the sidewalk uh, on Peachtree Street. Uh, we welcome you to stay. You can exit through uh, the narthex and enjoy some coffee and lemonade, an extended sort of table of sweets. Uh, please do stay around. Maybe meet someone you uh, don't know or say hello to someone you haven't seen in a while. But know that you're all welcome uh, to fellowship immediately following worship. Finally, um, members and friends want to encourage you to check in with the QR code that is on page five on the left-hand side of the right column. If you're with us for the very first time, again, welcome. Uh, we would love to receive some contact information from you, and all we're going to do is simply show up at your house for Easter dinner. <laughs> now, all we're going to do is send you an email uh, thanking you for joining us. And if there's any way that we could be supportive of you in this season of your faith and life, we want to know how we can do that. We are a church for our community, and uh, we want you to know that you're a part of that. And uh, we'd welcome the opportunity to pray for you, to serve you, and to support you in any way. Well, friends, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us now prepare our hearts for the worship of God. Good morning. Will you join me in our call to worship? Friends, the tomb is empty. The stone has been rolled away. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. For three days he lay in that cold and lonely tomb. But God's love cannot be contained by anything, not even death. Thanks be to God who gives us victory through our risen Lord. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? 
Where, O oh death, is your sting? Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Friends, let us stand in body or spirit and worship the living God. join me in prayer. Gracious and eternal God, on this Easter morning, we come before you with hearts filled with gratitude and awe. As we gather in your presence, we are reminded of the profound love you have shown us through the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. In this season of new life and renewal, we ask for your Spirit to be with us. 
Open our hearts to receive the message of Easter with joy and hope. Help us to understand the depth of your love for us and the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. We give thanks for the gift of salvation that we have received through Christ's resurrection. May we never take it for granted, but always strive to live as faithful disciples of our risen Lord. Bless our worship this day, and may all that we do bring honor and glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Amen. I want to welcome all the children who are worshiping uh, with us today. It's a delight to have you here. Uh, for those third graders-ish and less, you're welcome to go to Godly Play. If you're coming down the front, I think the best way to do it is to come right through the front pews here. You can come on down this way. Miss Katie and Miss Colleen are going to be over in the Worth Room, just right next door. Miss Colleen's right there in the corner. Um, and parents, one, remember if your children, child left or not, and get them in the Worth Room before you head to fellowship, okay? So we're glad to see so many children with us here uh, today, and happy Easter to all of you. Come on, guys, right through, yeah, right through here. Perfect. Catherine, will you help these folks right here, too? Thank you. We're, it takes a village. Here we go. Friends, I'm going to invite you to stand in body or in spirit as we sing our middle hymn, In Christ Alone. It's printed in your order for service. Let us stand.
Friends, you may be seated. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 25, verses 6 through 9. You can also feel free to read along with me in your pew Bibles on page 613 of the Old Testament. Now listen to and hear the word of God for you and for me. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, a rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wine strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the covering that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, And the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, See, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Here ends our first scripture reading. Our second scripture reading is from the Gospel of Luke, the fourth gospel in our New Testament, verses 36 through 49. If you'd like to follow along, it can be found on page 85 of the Pew Pew Bible in front of you. Listen now for a word from God. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then... He opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are my witnesses of these things, and see, I am sending upon you what my father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, we enter the sanctuary. We tune in remotely carrying some things that are light, carrying some things that are heavy, mindful of the places where things seem amiss in our lives, in the world. So I pray that you would open all of our hearts and our minds and our hands to this Easter message so that we would with clarity Hear again the good news that you're alive. In your name, amen. I recently heard my uh, friend, the senior rabbi Peter Berg, tell an old rabbi joke. He said there were three rich brothers and each wanted to do something special for their elderly mother on Mother's Day. So the first brother bought her a huge house, six bedrooms, 6,000 square feet. It was a mini mansion. The second brother bought her a Mercedes limousine, 
And with that limousine came a 24-hour-a-day driver. She would never have to drive anywhere ever again. The third brother, remembering how his mother loved to read the scriptures, but because of her failing eyesight, she could no longer do it, he got her a parrot. And he trained the parrot to recite any verse from the Bible on command. She would be able to hear the Word of God any time that she wanted. Not too long after the gifts were given, the brothers each received notes from their mother. The first son's note said, The house you bought me is much, much too big. I only live in a small part of it, yet I have to clean the entire thing. The second son got a note said, I rarely leave the house anymore, so I hardly use the limo you gave me. And when I do, I have to tell you, son, the driver is very rude. The third son's note had a different tone entirely. It said, my darling baby boy, my favorite son, you know the way to your mother's heart. The chicken was delicious. I think we can all agree on this general rule of thumb. If someone gives you a gift, make sure you know what it's for. When someone gives you a gift, make sure you know what it's for, lest you become like this mother and confuse a Bible-quoting parrot for Sunday supper. On this sacred day, on this Easter Sunday, I hope and I pray that there will not be one ounce of confusion on what the gift of Easter is all about. Easter is a gift, and it's a gift from God. And today, by God's grace, I want to speak about this gift. I want to be a witness to this gift so we all may know what Easter is for and what it means when we receive its truth. So I want to begin with this conviction. Easter is more than an empty tomb. Easter is more than an empty tomb. Easter is a relationship with the resurrected Christ. Our college junior, Johnny, uh, came home this week to be with us for the holiday weekend, and there are signs of his return scattered throughout the house. His car is parked in the driveway, his sneakers are by the door, his Rhodes College lanyard is hanging on the key ring, he's got books on virtually every table in the house, the suitcase is open in the family room, and his dirty clothes are piled up in the laundry room. There are signs all over the place that he's home. But that's not the gift. The signs are not the gift. These tokens are not the gift. He's the gift. Our relationship with him is the gift and his relationship with us. Easter is more than an empty tomb. Easter is more than symbols or tokens or reminders of Christ. Easter is Christ's actual presence with us. Easter is Christ alive by the power of the Holy Spirit. Christ alive and accessible to you and to me, even in this very moment. In Luke 24, Jesus appears to his disciples, and, and it's clear that Jesus shows up in the room. It's not a memory. He's there in the room. They see him. They, they, they hear his voice. They feel his love. He reveals himself to them, and he reestablishes community with them around a table and a piece of broiled fish. Very specific detail. There aren't, they aren't, rather, given a memory. They're not given a token. They're not given a haunting nor a ghost. They are given a renewed relationship and ongoing experience with 
the resurrected Christ. Friends, Easter is more than the symbolism of an empty tomb. Easter is the gift of a relationship with a Christ who is alive and accessible to us by the power of the Holy Spirit. In addition to that, I also want you to know that like any gift, like any gift, Easter is a gift that can be rejected or received. Like any gift, it can be rejected or received. Uh, It's not unusual for our church staff to receive emails or phone calls from people who are trying to track down loved ones who have been estranged for some significant amount of time from their loved ones or or family. Uh, Not too long ago, we received that kind of call. It was from a woman who was in search of her father. She hadn't heard from him or seen him in over nine years. She'd been calling shelters and and nonprofits and, and churches throughout Metro Atlanta in hopes that someone might recognize his name. Our church was on her list, and she connected with our director of community ministries, Trisha Pasuth, who knew that her father received mail. She recognized his name as one who received mail here at our church. You see, for those who don't know, one of the most important ministries we offer here at First Pres is providing an address to our friends who are experiencing homelessness or who are in some sort of transition because you can't get a job, you can't get benefits, you can't get legal documents unless you have a physical address. And so 1328 Peachtree Street Northeast is the address for over 700 of our friends. So the daughter wrote her father a letter and mailed it to the church and in the letter she explained that she and the whole family missed him, that they wanted to welcome him back into their lives. And she affixed her phone number to the letter and asked him to call. He received the letter, but several weeks passed, and he didn't respond. So the daughter, in her persistence, wrote another letter, reiterating her hope that reconciliation could be possible between them. Several more weeks passed, and the daughter still had not heard from her dad. Well, just this past week, the man came to campus to pick up his mail, and Tricia struck up a conversation with him, knowing the situation, and she said, I heard that your daughter has written you, I I heard that she wants you to call, I heard that she wants you to be back in her life. He acknowledged that he received the letters, but told Trish that he was scared, he was afraid. Would he really be welcomed back? Would he be forgiven? What about all this lost time? When Trisha told me the story, I immediately thought of the disciples from our gospel text. Remember, friends, they were scared too. They had their doubts, they had their fears, they had their trepidation. Also remember, and this is important to remember, that some of them had abandoned Jesus in his darkest hour. Some even denied him as a friend, as being one of his disciples. And as he showed up in that upper room to them, I wonder if they thought some of the same questions this man thought. What would Jesus say to these ones? Would he forgive them? Would he welcome them to himself? And those who know the story know that's exactly what Jesus does. He reestablishes relationship with them. And that's what this woman was doing. She was offering forgiveness. She was offering reconciliation. She was offering herself to her dad. But would her father receive it? He had a choice. We always have a choice. He had a choice. Reject it or receive it. And despite his fear and doubts, he said that he would connect with her. And I'm convinced that God used Trisha and the Holy Spirit in a particular way because Trisha began to share about her own father, who's now in his 80s, and the meaningful relationship they share. I think the Spirit used that conversation to soften his heart, to reach out to his daughter. 
When they talked, the first thing that he said to her was, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But she said, Dad, it's not necessary. We just want you in our life. We, we want to be in your life. That's all we want. And on this Easter Sunday, literally today, later on this afternoon, she's coming to Atlanta to see her dad for the first time in almost a decade. Easter's a gift. It's a gift extended by God to, to all people. It's like the daughter searching for her father, finding him, and inviting him back into her life and she back into his. Christ searches for us, finds us, invites us into relationship with him. But will we choose it? Will we receive it the way the gift is meant to be received? As you contemplate that question, let me share with you one more thought about this gift called Easter. Those that receive the gift of Easter are never, ever the same. They're never the same. 20th century philosopher Albert Camus said that death is the philosopher's only problem. He contemplated how can one find meaning and purpose in life when we know that all our efforts and every human endeavor will ultimately be nullified by death. How does one truly live when one knows that death will annihilate us and turn us into dust? How do we live without fear when it seems that oblivion is our destiny? What dare we hope in the shadow of our own extinction? The Christian knows that the gift of Easter opens the door to hope. For Easter assures us that life after death is possible. In the resurrection of Jesus Christ, God declares that death and sin have been defeated. They will not be victorious. Easter means that those who live and die in Christ will be raised with him in new life. The consequence of sin, the scripture says, is death. And, and, and death is annihilation. It is eternal nothingness. It is separation from God. But for the one who lives and dies in Christ, that one will be raised as he has been raised. Death and despair will not have the last word in the story of God. So if and when we receive this gift, we will never be the same. We'll be people of hope. People of hope. People who are not overcome by the fear of death or the fear that the principalities and powers of this world so often lord over us. If and when we receive the gift, we will also be a people who live and order our lives in accordance with the resurrected Christ. Tom was one of the most successful surgeons in the city. His success afforded him a beautiful home, notoriety, access, and a pretty comfortable lifestyle. And by all accounts, he was a decent guy. He was a happy guy. He believed in, his, he believed in God, but his faith was more ceremonial than comprehensive. It was more ritualistic than relational. Tom was a C&E Christian, which meant you could definitely find him on Christmas and Easter, but absent the other 50 or so weeks. And on one particular Easter, Tom and his wife were at their Presbyterian church when the pastor did something unconventional, at least unconventional for the frozen chosen Presbyterians. The conclusion of the service, the pastor invited some elders to come forward to stand in front of the chancel, and that when he would give the benediction, he would invite people to come forward who want to receive Christ in a new way or want to receive Christ for the first time, and that these elders would, would pray for them, pray for those individuals to come forward. So the pastor gives his benediction, a bunch of folks begin to file out toward the fellowship hour, but some folks do come forward and they are prayed for. The pastor was home later that afternoon when he got a phone call, and it was Tom. And he said, Reverend, you know how you invited people who wanted to welcome the resurrected Christ in a new way or, or welcome him for the very first time into their life to be prayed for? 
He said, I wanted to come forward. I, I really did. But, but, but it felt like there was a slab of granite on my lap weighing me down. And I just didn't have the strength to free myself from it and come forward. And the reason I'm calling you now is I'm wondering if it's too late. Is it too late to welcome Christ into my life? Is it too late to be prayed for? The pastor, of course, said, no, no, Tom. It's never too late. After the pastor had Easter dinner with his family, he drove to Tom's home. And Tom began their conversation by saying, Reverend, I'm happy, but I don't have a lot of joy. He said, I have notoriety, but I'm lonely. I have success, but I lack clarity of purpose. I believe in God, but I don't know God. I believe in God, but I don't know how to love God. And I want to know God, and I want to love God. And so Tom and the pastor prayed together, and Tom welcomed Christ into his life in a new and fresh way. And from that moment on, Tom was different. He was different. He was still challenged by the things that we're all challenged by. Life didn't all of a sudden become perfect for him. Life was still hard in so many ways. Things that he carried things that he saw his loved ones carry. But he faced those challenges and imperfections with faith and trust that God would be God in all things. Tom started reading the scripture. He started attending a weekly men's Bible study. He became a regular in worship. He leaned into the community. He started to pray more. He started sharing his story with honesty and vulnerability and authenticity. He began seeing his wealth and success as something that not just existed for his own pleasure, but something that could be in service to the good of others so that their lives would flourish too. He saw his medical profession as a way to serve God and to love God. The way he viewed his relationships changed. The way he viewed himself changed. He reordered his time and his priorities. He now knows how to categorize and interpret his greatest sadnesses and his deepest grief. He now knows that what God allows, God redeems. He now knows that his call is to renounce evil and its power in the world and to bear witness to the light of God's love. Tom's life was living proof of what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has passed away. New things have come into being. And that, friends, is the gift of Easter. Not a symbol, not a token, not a haunting, not a memory, not a ghost, but an ongoing encounter experience and relationship with the resurrected Christ. Easter is a gift, and when you receive it, you're never going to be the same. So may we all have the courage and the confidence and the conviction to receive it the way it was meant to be received so that we may be made new, so that the world could be made new, and so that we all could share in Christ's resurrection to the glory of God, now and forevermore. Amen. Friends, I invite you to rise in body or spirit as we affirm our faith together using the words that are printed in our bulletin or on your screen. This is the good news which we have received in which we stand and by which we are saved, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, and that he appeared first to the women, then to Peter, and then to the twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus Christ is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is our Lord and our God. Alleluia. Amen. You may be seated.
as is our custom following worship today, there will be a pastor to pray with anybody in the chapel who would like to receive prayer after worship. Let us continue in a spirit of prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, on this Easter Sunday, help us to soak in these truths that it's not just an empty tomb, you are alive and by the power of your Holy Spirit, you are here with us. May we receive the gift of Easter in our own lives, for we know that this gift changes everything. Fill us with your hope and strength and love. And in the mystery of your love and grace, you choose to be at work even through our prayers. Hear our silent prayers of intercession as we pray for your help. We pray for peace and justice. We pray for reconciliation and healing. We pray for an end to war. Lord, hear our silent prayers. We lift our prayers to you, God, and with grateful hearts for the ways that you are faithful and present in our lives. We join our voices together and we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. With grateful hearts, let us give to God a portion of what God has given to us.
God of resurrection and redemption, we offer our gifts alongside our alleluias. Our hands, feet, and voices are ready to carry this celebration beyond these walls into a world hungering for hope. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. In the risen Christ's name we pray, amen. <laughs> 